Hey there, everybody. Welcome to another Chem Complete lecture series. And today we are going to cover gas laws. So this is going to be a multi-part series on the channel. We're going to start with some of the basics, including gas behavior and the different variables that can affect gas behavior. Then we'll take a look at the basic gas laws, which is where we will compare two of the four variables and hold the other two constant and look at their mathematical relationship. And then we'll move into some of the more advanced math, looking at the ideal gas law and Dalton's partial pressures, some other material like that. So that all starts right now. All right, so the main goal for the first uh, lecture or two here will be to introduce the basic gas laws. And you can see it says less than ideal because these are not the ideal gas law. They come together and they form the ideal gas law, which will use all four variables that we'll talk about in a few minutes here. All right, so how can we describe the atomic arrangement of a gas? So this should be review if you're getting up to the point of gas laws. You should have at some point come across or been introduced to the concept of how a gas behaves. So take a second and think if you can answer this for yourself. All right, now here's what I would put. Gases are generally considered free-flowing, and there's going to be much space between the atoms or gas molecules. They are rapidly bouncing off the sides of a container that they are in. And they will also expand to fill the container that they're in. So that's one of the differences between a gas and a liquid. A liquid will morph to the shape of the container, but it will not expand itself to fill the entire container the way that a gas will. All right, so importantly, gases have no set volume or set shape of any sort. They are very, very, uh, I hate to use the word malleable because that's usually referred to solids, but they are malleable to the shape of their container. They will expand or contract based on where you put them. All right, so let's talk about the main variables or factors that can affect gas behavior. Okay, so gases are very sensitive to their environmental conditions. They exhibit either large levels of compressibility or expansibility, expansiveness. All right, now this is kind of the premise behind how explosives work if you talk about expansive ability because when you have explosives, you need a lot of usually nitrogen and oxygen. So nitrogen is a very stable gas and it forms rapidly and will expand outwards. And then oxygen we know is a good fuel source. You need oxygen in order to have burning and fire. And so those two components tend to make for uh, ripe conditions for explosiveness. Okay, now the opposite is certainly true in terms of compressibility. And uh, think about if you ever go to something like a party store, right, and they have balloons there, and you want to fill the balloons up with some helium, well, that helium is condensed or compressed into a tank and is sitting in that helium tank behind the counter. So gases can expand and be compressed very readily. All right, now, what different factors actually affect the behavior of a gas? Well, there's four big ones that we're going to discuss here, which are pressure, volume, number of moles of the actual gas, and temperature. So our goal is going to be to see how these interrelate on a mathematical basis to one another. So let's start with pressure, which is the first of the four. Pressure is going to be a force that is applied over a specific area. So this is the general physics term or science term for pressure, right? Now we're interested in pressure specifically related to gas chemistry since we're studying gases. So when we talk about pressure with gas chemistry, it's going to be referring to the relationship of the atmosphere pressure on a gas and the pressure that the gas exerts back in return, okay? So if you take a look at general physics or Newtonian laws, you have um, equal and opposite forces, right, in these types of interactions. And so we have to consider the pressure exerted by the atmosphere on a gas, and in return, the pressure that the gas will exhibit back towards whatever side of the container it has against the atmosphere. 
Okay, now pressure is most commonly measured with a barometer. So most students are aware of a thermometer, which is for temperature. A barometer is used to measure pressure. And if you take a look at the old thermometers, they used mercury, right? And then changes in temperature would either make the mercury level rise or fall to a certain calibrated point where we take the temperature. And a barometer works in a similar fashion. So you end up having a mercury level that could rise and fall based on the various uh, pressure that's in the uh, surrounding atmosphere. Okay, now pressure is usually given in one of several units. The most common is atmosphere, ATM. So that's kind of a standardized unit that we use, particularly when we're starting to work with gas laws. When we get to the ideal gas law, you'll have to use atmospheres due to a constant that has certain uh, units built in. Okay, but some other common ones, millimeter of mercury, now keep in mind we don't do inches of mercury or PSI because those are not considered metric units when we're talking about pounds and inches, right? Um, but millimeters of mercury and then that is also synonymous, which means it's the same as a TOR. So TOR is an abbreviation for pressure. It is an abbreviation of the last name of the inventor of the barometer and so a TOR would be considered a millimeter of mercury as far as units are concerned. Okay, so how do we relate these to one another? Well, one ATM, one atmosphere, is going to be equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which will, again, also be equal to 760 tor, because they are equivalent to one another. Okay, so if you're going to do any sort of unit conversion, you want to have this relationship established here. So speaking of which... Let's go ahead and do a little bit of practice here. So anytime we come across problems, because I'm going to have quite a number of them when we deal with gas laws, it's a very math-heavy subject, I want you to pause the video, attempt to solve it, and then unpause it when you feel you're ready, or if you're stuck, then I will obviously uh, be proceeding forward. You can check your answer. Okay, so what is 713 millimeters of mercury in atmospheres? Try this one. All right, so 713 millimeters of mercury, I would need to divide by 760 millimeters of mercury. So the millimeters of mercury would cancel. That is equal to one ATM, which I would put in the numerator. And as a result, we end up with 0.938 ATM. Notice that the 713, we assume, is coming from a measurement. Okay, it's not an exact value. And therefore, if there was three significant figures going into the calculation, it's all multiplication division. There should be three significant figures coming out of the calculation. Here's another one. What is 1.26 ATM in TOR? Let's try that. Okay, so 1.26 ATM. You would need to multiply by 760 TOR, which is equal to 1 ATM. So the ATMs cancel out because it's in the denominator over in the conversion here. And when you multiply by 760, you get 958 TOR. Same premise, three sig figs in and three sig figs out. All right, so volume is probably a bit more familiar to most of us because volume is introduced very early on in a chemistry course. We know about liters. You may have learned about concentration by this point in a course that you've been taking. All right, so volume refers to the physical space that the gas is going to occupy. We've talked about matter uh, before, so matter is going to be anything that, number one, has mass, and number two, takes up space. Well, gases, little individual particles of gas, are made up of atoms, which are physical matter. They take up space. Okay, now the common units we're going to see for volume would be liter-based, so Keep in mind that you could have your prefixes like milliliter, kiloliter, but usually uh, liter is going to be what we're working with. And again, when we get to the ideal gas law, you're going to have to operate in liters. You're not going to be allowed to work in milliliters or anything else like that. Okay, so if you need to, probably a good time to review any prefixes, especially the milli to the liter, right? So when we have that 10 to the minus third, and we need to go back and forth between liter and milliliter, because milliliter is a very common measurement in the chemistry lab. Make sure that you're reviewing that and you know those. All right, and then all the gas variables can interrelate to one another, which is the whole goal behind this lecture. So now that we've seen two of them, the pressure and volume, okay, we're going to take a look at how they work together. 
So this brings about the very first gas law that we're going to take a look at of the simple gas laws. There's three big ones, okay, and this is pressure and volume. So this is known as Boyle's law when we look at how pressure and volume interrelate to one another. Volume and pressure share probably the most obvious relationship, and you can see the image I have here, okay, which is a balloon that's being squeezed. So think about if you're talking about volume, the space that a gas occupies and pressure, imagine that you hold a an imaginary canister of gas in your hands, or a balloon, if you'd like, that can't pop. And you start to press down, right? You compress, you compress, you're pressing down. What are you doing with the pressure? Well, in that case, you're increasing the pressure, right? And so what's happening to the volume as you're lowering your hands, making it smaller, smaller, smaller? As you increase the pressure, you're decreasing the volume, right? So these are going to be an inverse relationship as pressure goes up right as i compress down on a gas the volume of the gas has to decrease and vice versa so if i alleviate pressure if i start to expand or remove that pressure on the gas the gas is going to be able to expand out further and the volume will increase so it's an inverse relationship okay now here is how we uh, represent that inverse relationship mathematically it's P1 V1 equals P2 V2. And you may have seen this as PI VI in some of your courses, meaning initial, and then PF VF for final. I use 1 and 2. You can use I and F if you like. Okay, so P1 is the initial pressure of a gas, with V1 being the initial volume that gas takes up. And then we can set that equal to P2, which is the final pressure, and volume 2, because they have to change with one another to keep a specific ratio. All right, now notice the little asterisk here that says temperature and moles of gas remain constant or unchanged. So when we do the simple gas laws, if we're going to relate them to one another, we have to hold the other two constants at a steady, unchanging value. And the reason for that is if all four of them jump in, Okay, there's different dynamics at play, and then we need the ideal gas law when we're going to use all four. So these are the simpler gas laws, and we'll build up to the ideal gas law, which uses all four of those variables. Okay, so here's a practice. A woman has an initial lung volume of 2.75 liters, which is filled with air at an atmospheric pressure of 1.02 atms. If she increases her lung volume to 3.25 liters without inhaling any additional air, what is the pressure in her lungs? So here's what I would encourage you to do. Number one, see if you can label P1, V1, P2, and V2. Can you identify what each of the values are and which one is missing? Which one do we need to solve for? So take a minute and try that. Pause the video and then unpause it when you're ready. And I'll proceed forward here. All right, so hopefully you were able to find out that V1 was the 2.75 liters, P1 was the 1.02 atmospheres, and V2 was 3.25 liters. What we want to solve for is P2, all right, as the woman is breathing here. So now go ahead and implement this based on the equation that we saw earlier. Okay, so actually solve for P2 using Boyle's Law. So again, pause this make an attempt, and then unpause it, and you can move forward. All right, hopefully you had a chance to try that. So here we go. We have P1, 1.02 atm, times V1, 2.75 liters, equals P2 times V2, which is 3.25 liters. So we just need to do a little bit of algebra here. On the left-hand side, P1 and V1, we can multiply those to give the value 2.805, and then that can be set equal to the right side, which is P2 times 3.25 liters. So now I need to divide through by 3.25 liters in order to isolate P2 by itself algebraically. And when I do that, I end up with P2. Keep in mind, you want to go back to the original values here, okay, as far as significant figures are concerned. So the biggest value as far as sig figs is going to be 3. They all have 3, so the answer should have 3. So if you solve for this, you put this in your calculator, you're going to see that P2 is 0.863 ATM. Now one of the things I always like to do is just give myself a little check and make sure that this makes sense. So 
if volume was 2.75 to start and the volume expanded or increased right to 3.25 then that means i need to see a decrease in pressure right because they're inversely related so if the volume increases then the pressure must decrease so my initial pressure was 1.02 atm and then p2 is 0.863 atm so i am good to go there it's not a problem all right number two this is Boyle's law a sample gas has an initial volume of 5.6 liters at a pressure of 735 millimeters of mercury if the pressure of the gas is decreased to 440 millimeters of mercury what is the new volume the gas occupies all right so take a shot at this one number one see if you can find p1 v1 p2 and v2 pause the video and then unpause it when you feel ready all right so this is what you should have obtained v1 is 5.6 liters p1 is 735 millimeters of mercury v2 is what we're attempting to solve and p2 is going to be 440 millimeters of mercury all right so now again pause it use those values and try to attempt solving Boyle's law in order to find v2 okay so if we take a look here we put p1 which was 735 millimeters of mercury times v1 which was 5.6 liters and this is going to equal uh, p2 which is 440 millimeters of mercury times v2 all right now if you take a look up here 5.6 only has two sig figs this is all multiplication division so the answer should only have two sig figs when we finish all right now you're allowed to carry larger values throughout but you need to make sure that your final answer only has two so on the left we have 4116 millimeters of mercury liter okay so these units get combined and then we still have our p2 v2 so again divide solve for v2 or isolate v2 by itself and you end up with 9.4 liters mathematically all right i think this is where we're going to stop this particular lecture so we will pick up with part two of the simple gas laws next time so i hope you were able to follow along with everything remember to like and subscribe so liking the video always helps us with the algorithm it boosts us up if you appreciate all the content Okay, subscribing will keep you up to date with everything and if you leave any comments i will do my best to get back to you and also as always head on over to chemcomplete.com where we have all sorts of free resources we also have paid for guides that i've put together if you'd like to support the channel in other ways but just by watching and participating with us you're supporting the channel more than we could ever ask for already so thank you very much and i will see everybody for the next lecture